Okay, uh, we'll move to the talk by Fred Morton and Stefano Harnin. Um, I'm extremely happy and all of us extremely happy that they're here with us. Their work, not only for me, but I think for many, is extremely inspirational in so many ways. Stefano Harni and Fred Morton are authors of the Undercommon, Undercommons, uh, Fugitive Planning and Black Study, and All Incomplete. Fred teaches at New York University. Stefano teaches at Royal Holloway University of London. They are students of the Black Radical Traditions, Tradition and members of the of Le Mardi Gras Listening Collective and the Center for Convivial Research and Autonomy. Thank you. Okay, hi everybody. Fred, can you hear me? I can hear you. You can hear me? Okay. Um, yeah. I'm just going to start out for a second, okay, Fred? Okay. All right. Oh, I see you now. There you are. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Thank you um, for coming out on this hot evening, and and uh, and I especially like to start by um, acknowledging um, my old friend Gigi and, and and thanking her especially for for keeping us in mind. Um, the last time we were here, we were also here, thanks to Gigi, and I really appreciate that we've been able to study together all these years. Um, I'd also like to thank the House of World Culture. Uh, I remember very clearly participating in one of their um, one of their iterations of Former West. It was a very formative experience for me, um, and I'm I'm glad to be part of the program um, that they're on. And then, of course, uh, everyone at the Goethe Institute who has been so kind to me and helped me to get here. Um, we um, we're going to uh, read some new work. Um, and, and when I say new work, uh, work subsequent to a book that we just published called All Incomplete. Um, and this is work very much inspired by the texts that were coming around and the descriptions of this particular event. So we also owe you uh, a debt for that. Um, the way we're going to do it is I'm going to start and read a short section of the text. And then Fred's going to read a section of the text and then I'll come back and read another section of the text, okay? Uh, so um, this first section is um, based on, on two sources. Uh, one is a, a song and a video by KRS-One, the, um, the, the hip hop star. And um, the other is a book by, it's still forthcoming by a guy called um, Derek Ford. His book's called Marxism, Pedagogy, and the General Intellect. And it's a very interesting critique of the knowledge economy. So his work also uh, inspires this first section. All right. So overall, our talk is called Abolition and Exodus. <clears throat> this section is called You Must Learn. You Must Learn announces KRS-One and Boogie Down Productions. The lyrics of the song are an injunction to learn global black history. But in the video that both accompanies and revises the song, we see a particular figure, a bearded black man dressed in robes. He seems to represent the wisdom and the history Keras one urges his listeners to learn. He stands holding two tablets, reminiscent of the Jewish prophet Moses. But Moses is not portrayed with African features in either religious texts or historical texts. And this wise man wears dreadlocks. According to our knowledge of Moses, this man cannot be Moses. And yet we are familiar with the portrayal of Moses holding the tablets. With this figure in the video, for you must learn, learning has already turned against itself, undermined itself, cast itself into doubt. It is more than a correction in knowledge that we're witnessing here. It's a subversion of learning. In short, learning has turned into study as Derek Ford would put it in his forthcoming book, Marxism, Pedagogy, and the General Intellect, Beyond the Knowledge Economy. The incitement to acquire knowledge has been disrupted by this figure who challenges our knowledge. It raises the question of what KRS-One means by learning. The image cannot but invoke an unsettling of the knowledge of who Moses is and what is on those tablets. Moreover, the image of this prophet in dreadlocks 
also invokes what might be considered an antagonism to settled knowledge, a different way of knowing, a different way of study. Groundings, as it's come to us most famously from the conversations between Walter Rodney and Rastafarians, he speaks within Jamaica, disrupts and detours his command to learn with an insistent and ongoing black study. 15 years ago, when Fred and I first started to make the distinction between black study and black studies, we didn't have the benefit of Derek Ford's work, but we did have Lawrence Chris Parker, better known as KRS-One. What both Ford and Parker teach us is that learning, or in this case, black study, emerges from study, from black study, and that this is the real injunction to practice study, black study in the face of settled settler knowledge. Next, in the video, the wise men tosses the tablets into the air. They land as two records on the turntables operated by Dean Nice during the performance of the video. The presumably written knowledge of the tablet has landed in the middle of an unruly aesthetic, in the middle of a hip hop song. It's been transformed into the genre and art that perhaps more, has more to say about the concept of time and by extension history than any other contemporary art form. Now learning's not only cut and undercut by the orality of groundings, but also by the musicality of hip hop. No matter the prophets, prophets, here we're using the, the word prophets as in prophet and as in, uh, as in a, a prophecy. Uh, as the scholar Imani Perry would rightly remind us, she wrote a book about the way in which hip hop was um, uh, put to work for, uh, for capital. Um, when any knowledge of history, however, moves through music, its communicability and transparency as knowledge and as history become attenuated, opaque, and undecidable and other forms of value emerge. Music then requires a kind of substitute unit of value, a singer, a track, a concert, a download, but those only temporarily individuate and commoditize what has become, as it, uh, as it has always been, collective study. This is what the scholar Fumio Kiji shows us in her wonderful discussion of record collections in Jazz as Critique. Against the European tradition where knowledge of music equates to its internal coherence, the jazz record constantly fails to capture the performance, which is its form, Okiji suggests, and by failing, quote, cackles with incessantly reforming constellations, unquote. A jazz record collection, quote, holds within it a multitude of heterophonic choruses, unquote, in black study. So when KRS-One raps, you must learn, he's hardly advocating the path to success in what was already becoming known as the knowledge economy. For Derek Ford in his, board anal in his bold analysis, it is the knowledge economy that brings into relief the implicit pedagogy of capitalism. Capitalism pedagogy commands us to learn. One might even say forces us to learn by accusing us of ignorance. Learning under capitalism produces knowledge for sale and Ford notes that only knowledge that can be sold is even given the title knowledge. But he reminds us that this knowledge also produces ignorance, where ignorance is nothing other than the pressures of capitalist accumulation for more. This ignorance can only be addressed by more learning and thus by more productivity. Ignorance has also too often been accepted as a starting point for Marxist praxis. By accepting ignorance as a starting point, Marxists risk accepting the capitalist definition of knowledge. Only the knowledge that can be put to use for accumulation and growth was worthy of the name. Thus, Ford reminds us capitalism drew Marxism into a dialectic of ignorance and learning on its own terrain. In contrast, Ford will stress for us the, the possibility of maintaining an antagonism to learning and an exodus from the knowledge economy. Boogie Down Production starts learning and ends up studying using the antagonism of groundings to keep knowledge a step behind off the pace and off the beat. The key to the concept of exodus in Italian workerist and post-workers thought is that with the coming of the knowledge economy 
to flee capitalist work is to smuggle out the goods. On the way out of Egypt, Exodus escapes with the social relations that produce value in a knowledge economy. We take it with us. There is no machine that's left behind. Fixed capital becomes, in a sense, unfixed in flight. But just as knowledge is haunted in its unending revisions uh, by groundings, the Italian Exodus is also shadowed by another Exodus. Except this Exodus throws any knowledge of the way out of Egypt into confusion because the way out of Egypt is through Ethiopia. And it might be the movement of Jaw people, but it's not clear, as in transparent and communicable, how to get there. This movement trails Exodus with fugitivity, leaving it unfinished and unmapped. Think of Gregory Isaacs singing, if I could reach the border, then I could step across, as if he planned to step out of this country and into Africa. But then he continues, I'm leaving out of Babylon, leaving out. I'm leaving out to Rome, leaving out to Rome. His plan defines the knowledge, defies the knowledge of direction and geography. It's a fugitive plan. Hiding study where they will not look for it and practicing study where it can flourish emerges as Derek Ford's real concern. Here the fugitive requirement to hide in plain sight or, or close quarters emerges. And the knowledge economy, in turn, reveals itself as nothing more than racial capitalism's latest innovation in seeking, sorting, and managing, and where necessary, destroying or trying to destroy what it cannot capture. Jared Hanlon, in his book, The Dark Side of Management, uncovers a precursor text of the field of management studies, written in 1915. In this text called The Job, the Man, and the Boss, the authors, Blackford and Newcomb, identify nine physical variables in the body that determine the human's capacity to labor, among them skin color, hair texture, and bodily proportion. From these variables, the authors claimed a boss can find the right role for every worker. As Hanlon tells us, not much has changed in human resource management, though managers no longer seek to examine palms and skulls as Blackford and Newcomb would have ideally liked to do with each worker. In the knowledge economy, the variables become much more thoroughly mental than physical, though the mental bears the social history of the physical. New variables emerge, such as ignorance and stupidity. Ford tells us that whereas ignorance as a variable is easily slotted into the new division of labor, in the knowledge economy, stupidity now sits at the bottom of the capacity list, redundant and unemployable. Stupere in the Latin meant to be amazed, confounded, struck dumb, and not perhaps by a superior knowledge, but by something other, something superior to knowledge. But the, stu the stupid do not just sit together in wonder, confounded. They also confound. They hide their knowledge in records and turntables and groundings and study. Philosophy is not in the music. The music is the philosophy, as Okiji teaches us, contra Theodore Adorno. Or as Derek Hall sums it up perfectly, there is always a noise from which knowledge emerges uh, and to which it returns. And I'll turn the next section over to Fred. Um, <clears throat> can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, I just want to echo Stefano's thanks to all the folks who have organized uh, this meeting and, and also to add my apology that I couldn't be there in person with you. Um, I wish I were there. So what I'm going to read are three little short pieces that, um, you know, following along in the vein and in echo of what Stefano just read, but that are also uh, functions of, of, of certain occasions to speak that emerged over the last month or so, um, really in the beginning, beginning I, or maybe two months, um, beginning with various celebrations uh, that were occurring here uh, for May Day. So um, the first is called Strike MoMA, and it was written as part of a uh, to be read as 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 a as a statement of solidarity with the folks who were organizing a strike against the Museum of Modern Art in in New York. 
Let's join the ongoing strike against MoMA, which has been fought since its inception, which is the strike of the people of the city of New York, who continue to choose to practice aesthetic and intellectual sociality otherwise and elsewhere. For them, the question isn't how to get, but is rather how to refuse the extraction of recognition, resources, and attention that MoMA hoards, defiles, and distributes with brutal, warlike, thieving benevolence. That strike, like every other strike, is a practice of contradiction. This strike of MoMA, which held in that strike of MoMA, which is held in the ongoing general strike, is always in need of refinement and exacerbation in the deepening unto seismic solicitation of the contradiction. What holds us back in or from the strike's a formative generality? And how does the strike animate us with and as its fugitive force? The strike and its variants, boycott, riot, hangout, revival, Sabbath, orgy, organize and orient our comportment toward and with and through one another. Protest tends to comport itself towards him and his shit. Do we need to call him and tell him to call his friends so his friends can come get him and his shit and then go get their own shit and get the shit out of here and everywhere? Will that have been merely protest? Maybe we need to get our shit and go. Here's the entanglement of abolition and exodus. Are we rehearsing for that? Will our rehearsal have become that in and as its practice? It feels like that's the question being asked right now, along with the question concerning how abolition and exodus go with enough impurity in and for friendship that we never let the institution in its absolute invasiveness come between us. This is where aesthetic practice where, as Marx says, the senses are theoreticians in that practice, brushes up against its avatars, artists, and as artwork with gentle, absolute, and absolutely destructive violence in love. To have gone to the museum, not to see, but to see through its objects, is maybe a little part of that. To love what happens in the museum without loving the museum and its objects will have been to begin the exotic practice, its abolition. Is going there in order to see through what's there to a presencing that is not there, a practice that will have begun to winnow itself away once it has begun? We're getting ready to go, in other words. Abolition, exodus, riot, strike, boycott are just terms for how we practice gathering and approaching, surfacing, gone. Come on, let's go. Let's move. Let's groove. Let's get it on or get it off or let's get off. Let's love. Let's live. Since we got to be here, let's leave. The second piece is called performative and constitutive redu. Social existence, talking shit, political inexistence. And it's got two epigraphs. The first is from Amiri Baraka's poem, Black People. And the second is from a commentary on that poem by a commune edition it's called Baraka the Divide. Here's the first one. You can't steal nothing from a white man. He's already stole it. He owes you anything you want, even his life. All the stores will open up if you will say the magic words. The magic words are up against the wall, motherfucker. This is a stick up or smash the window at night. These are magic actions. Smash the windows, daytime, anytime, together. Let's smash the window, drag the shit from in there. No money down, no time to pay. Just take what you want. Commune Editions then writes, for the present, we want to hold on to the possibility that we are at a divide, that the moment in which the opposition between cliches of intellectualism and cliches of militancy might dissolve is both behind us and ahead. 
Are there real magic actions? How are they related to magic words? Are there real magic words? What's lost in the distance between magic actions and the appearances, the statements, the tell Is that gap already there and given in the street or in some supposed ascendancy when subsistence, heightened by personal expression, rises to movement or higher still, rebel? Is to think that person is to think that personal expression, the taking to the street as stage, constitutes a movement which is stilled in becoming stance, stand, a little imperium as plot, a point from which to make a weak ass point, a tragic flaw, hamartia, as James came to understand it in the Black Jacobins. The tick like pseudo kinetic boisterousness of political shade folds so easily into the liberal project that motherfuckers quickly claim a mechanics of reform they would denounce as both liberal and performative were it to appear in anyone else's statement. This is given most emphatically and brutally and ineffectually normally when some dronish body's conviction in the genocidal and geocidal system of jurisprudence to which he had been devoted, his plot imaginally elongated into an extensionless segment tracing the carceral non-distance between enforcement and sacrifice is taken as a sign of victory or more soberly and with more embarrassment, progress. It's not that we're just talking loud and saying nothing. It's that all our talking does is say the same old shit. We just be doing things with deeds made words or more by soberly stating with more embarrassment by problems. When it's out on the streets, we say. We say my performance states that this is where and who I am. In all this constitutive performing, in all this talking shit a mile a minute or a mile an hour if you're marching, we haven't done nothing. The hyperallergic, hyperactivist hype is double straightjacketed. Meanwhile, there are the real magic actions of subsistence continually reimagined, surrealized in social alchemy, in anarchy on the street where you live. Where is the street where you live? Where is the street where you work? What if the primary work of words is greeting? What if we don't want almost all of what's in all the stores? What if that's a statement about what we'll want when we give it all away? What if all that's all that's been going on underneath as usual? When will being out in the street have been felicitous in its preformative constancy? The third section is called Whither the Commune. And it's in honor of the 150th anniversary of the Paris Commune. Our interest in the Commune is really an interest in its prefatory aftermath, which disturbs the punctuality and linearity of space time and its human histories. If you listen to the impression song, We're a Winner, you know the music is the making of the music. The music is the music's social situation. Its coalescence or congealment into event or thing or artwork is just the clue, just the hint at before and after, which is the ongoing coming and going that keeps on coming. An approach as commune editions into an extended non-arrival, an anoriginal forgiven having left, is there an assumed formality and an assumed capacity for entering or occupying form? An assumed and exclusive kind of bodily comportment that undergirds the commune while holding it away from us at the end of the day? If so, let's try to be concerned with the end of the day or the ends of the day with les out and post particulate petroleums coming and going to and from work smoking the cigarettes they make like a rebellious swarm of birds with neither heroin nor tonal center, each to have been constrained in the ingeniously individual waywardness that ends in resolution. I'm thinking of Carmen, of course, which as Susan McClary and Delphine Morday tell us, 
Georges Bizet offered as a kind of communard. He was trying to understand perhaps what happens in the break between can see and can see, when and where Sevilla, Paris, and La Habana are one another's indeterminative outskirts. What if the coming into relief or definition of the commune as a spatio-temporally determinative determinate event, even if tinged with an uncertainty that allows us not to know its time and place at once, is an error of in metaphysics that we need not disavow, but rather escape and surround and set aside and set beside itself and set on fire in endless revolution, like the precincts in which our already existing politics releases itself. It's not that this is not an anti-institutional imperative. It's that before and after that, it it comes and keeps on coming as anti-institutional practice. At stake are the differences between institution and instituting, and between movement and move. Okay. Um. Um, we got one more piece and then we can get into a conversation if that's okay. <clears throat> this is brief. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is called uh, Abolition and Exodus to Move. And it's dedicated to Consuela Africa who, who died this week. The clip is from a Coursera course offered by Princeton University. In it, children's bones are examined for educational purposes. The course is called Real Bones, Adventures in Forensic Anthropology, but it's not for educational purposes. Coursera is a business. Investors currently value it at over $1 billion. The bones are the remains of children murdered by the police in 1985 in the bombing of the Move House in Philadelphia. The University of Pennsylvania has been keeping them in a cardboard box marked Move for more than 40 years. Natricia, known as Tree, and Delicia, Africa, were children when they were killed in the brutal assault on their home in Philadelphia in, the, in 1985. A C4 bomb was dropped on their house while they hid in the basement under blankets to avoid the smoke from rounds of tear gas canisters shot into the house. The blankets were already soaked from water pumped in by high-powered hoses. When they attempted to surrender, the police began a barrage of 10,000 rounds of ammunition, including from a Thomas Thompson machine gun. The bomb ignited a fire. The children could tell this smoke was different from the smoke of the tear gas canisters. These were the last minutes of Tree and Delicia's These were last minutes of Tree and Delicia's lives. But like Henrietta Lacks, Tree and Delicia were also to have their afterlives stolen for profit. What Move had temporarily refused in life when America called. The Ivy League thieved in death like the thieving ghouls they are. They settled the forensic accounts as they always do. Move remains an anti-police brutality organization. It believes in the equality of all species, and many of its earlier protests in the 1970s took place at pet stores and at the Philadelphia Zoo. Originally, it was against something it called synthetic education, um, the idea of starting by teaching students to read and write. This position changed, but at its heart was a critique of the technological production process, um, the very knowledge economy. <clears throat> MOVE is often portrayed as a back-to-nature organization, misplaced somehow in the city. MOVE still understood in most accounts as having created a backlash because of their lifestyle. Ironically, their lifestyle was that they were composting. <laughs> um, MOVE is still understood in most accounts 
to have created backlash because of their lifestyle. But this is wrong. Somehow, according to this line of thinking, the move were supposed to follow the settler mode of retreat and go into a compound in the countryside. But move were not bound for a settler retreat. They were bound for an exodus. And that's not a geographical place. And it has no moving date. In any case, where would they go? The reasons the kids were in the building when the police dropped the bomb and let the fire burn for more than an hour was at a more rural Virginia house where the kids had been sent away for their protection had also been raided. But even this sending away was just a tactic. It wasn't philosophical. What MOVE knows is that there's no escaping exodus. But there was something else. MOVE held 38 protests in its first year of existence around the city. MOVE knew then, and no doubt knows even more painfully now, that there's no exodus without abolition. Something that settler retreats neither know nor likely want. MOVE was an abolitionist organization, not a back-to-nature cult. They didn't build fortifications in fear of the police. They built them because they gave the police something to fear. But most of all, MOVE was and remains an experimental family. Tri and Delicia were children in that family. <clears throat> Delicia was Delbert Af Africa's daughter. Delbert Africa was infamously beaten by the police while a camera from the Philadelphia Inquirer filmed the abuse. The three officers were nonetheless acquitted. Tree's mother, Consuela Africa, was alive when the news broke that the bones of these children were being displayed for educational purposes and for profit on Princeton's Coursera course. Consuela Africa died this week. Move said she fell ill when she heard the news of the fate of her child's remains. I worked briefly for Coursera. What is yet to emerge in this story is that it's now Coursera who owns this course, including the video of the professor handling the bones of these children, calling their bones greasy and with a not unpleasant smell. In other words, the remains of Tree and Delicia may come back from the professor emeritus in anthropology who kept them in the box, who's now visiting at Princeton but comes from the University of Pennsylvania, then to the coroner's office in Philadelphia and eventually to the Africa parents. But Coursera can do what it likes with the video, the course, these words and these images. It can do what it likes with the remains of these murdered children. Coursera's business model is the conversion of looming labor into dead labor. In some industries, it's not always a given that dead labor is cheaper than living labor, but it's a given in higher education. It's just been hard to work out how to do it. The first generation of MOOCs failed to live up to their promise. These MOOCs had a public relations strategy based around mass access or access to the masses and a business strategy of bulk buying and selling. But they largely featured the same hour-long lecture as on campus, and students were bored by the model, just as they're bored on campus. The university tried to get its stars to lecture as a way to counter the boredom of actually existing higher education, which is boring. But this went against its own business model. After all, the university's public relations strategy is to put a star lecture in economics or art history on the website, but its labor relations strategy is to, get, is to say that we can get anyone to teach economics or art history. Um, but Coursera is different. It chops up lectures into bite-sized bits, features a lot of small exercise, and self-tests continuously, allowing students to move through it and digest each bit at the student's pace. It's most likely that the ghoulish display of Tree and Delicia's remains was limited to a 10-minute clip followed by a self-diagnostic test on the clip. Most of, our, all, most of all, Coursera owns, reuses, and redeploys all the content, including the short lectures. This mode of learning at your own pace is already the way employees pass tests in corporations on required topics such as diversity and equality, health and safety, and how they do skills upgrade leading to quote-unquote promotion. With this model, Coursera also anticipates any withdrawal or refusal of labor. 
from the content providers, as they call the lecturers and professors who work with them. And they do this through a mix of proprietary rights, automation, and the labor relations of complete replaceability. Be useless to an attempt an exodus from the university today. Things will carry on without us. The agents at Princeton and UPenn are very clear about this. So was MOVE. MOVE understood that there could be no exodus without abolition, and there could be no abolition without exodus. The forensic eloquence of their collective lives remains up against the forensic science trying to keep them apart. What about us? How do we move? Thank you. order. <laughs> I went out of the screen. Thank you very much for this complex and inspiring talk. So I guess I will soon open to questions from the public. Um, I guess I'll just repeat the question, how, how do we move and, and this kind of return to kind of noise and, and this kind of lack of capture and, and the knowledge and, and also what kind of Fred was talking about, about this kind of other, other practices that are always there. And I think so much of your work, you always return to those practices that we are already within, they are already happening. And that's such a different notion from thinking something as kind of transformative or as doing is more like looking of what is already there that we're already in it already within it so I don't know if if you want to open up that in relation to evolution and exodus perhaps <laughs> um, <clears throat> Fred should I start <laughs> um, well, yes, thank you for that question and for putting those things together. We are, you know, as you can see, trying to explore how we're going to understand the relationship between exodus and, exodus and abolition. And in order to do that, we are going back through all the great thinkers on questions of abolition and and all the great thinkers of questions of Exodus. And some of these thinkers take, take a form that is recognized in the Western Academy, and some of them make music, and, and some of them you know, practice, practice a daily life that Fred was talking about, of uh, reinventing subsistence uh, every day um, in some surreal way. Um, so that's part of our exploration, and, and we're really grateful to be able to come here and to, and to and to talk to you about it because, as you mentioned and announced, that uh, Greece is a place that's been experimenting with exodus, experimenting with, um, I'd say, forms of abolition, um, you know, um, with regard to the state, with regard to the police for, you know, for many years now. Um, we, we note the most recent period because it became so famous, but um, Greek history is, is, is the history of, of exodus and abolition. Um, going back 100, 100 years or at least more, 200 years. So, um, so this is a good place for us to try to get, gain inspiration and get help. Uh, <laughs> and we're here to do both. Uh, in, in the in the video, there also Ruan Grupa that gave the lecture before. Uh, so I don't know how I can put those two different <laughs> discussions uh, together. Um, 
I guess I'll um, voice my question that I had uh, previously uh, while watching the video, uh, which was that you talk a lot about uh, necessities and context and ecosystems and relations. And, um, and then you talked about your current um, um, kind of um, relation with Documenta. So I guess the obvious question is, is, is that ever translatable? Is this kind of forms of relation ever translatable? And, 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 and if, if they are, in, in what ways? Like I'm thinking of certain practices of, of, of here, for gaps, for, uh, and, and, and many times like I've been trying to think of, of, of them um, in a way out of context, and I don't know how we can see them out of context, or, or what do they become after uh, out of context? And, and you know, that's also interesting questions to explore. But I would be saying, how how do you see that? How do you see these questions out of context in another context? If I can start, or, or is it for us? Yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah, uh, and I hope you can hear me. Thank you very much for everyone as well. Uh, for having us here uh, from different places. And then I'm sorry also for his one thought that he was facing some emer family emergencies. So, uh, but yeah, a lot of the work we realized as well, more and more actually, as you said, uh, maybe it's not my, like we can try, no? Like we can try to, not to translate maybe, but to, test certain sensibilities, whether it sticks, let's say, on other context. And then I think the process itself, it's not about the result, but the process itself, at least for us, is valuable. So that's one. But second, I think, try to answer. I hope I understand the question correctly. But like, uh, there are a lot of invisible work. And then keeping that invisible work invisible so not try to aestheticize it and make it seems like art or representing it like art. Maybe it's it's one of the biggest challenge, but it's very needed, let's say. So let's not try to represent activism, for example, you know. Uh, and then what we're trying to do as well, like, you know, clashing or clashes of this sensibilities on histories as well, how we understand ourselves as something institution, maybe not not non, maybe ARA, maybe something else, you know, and then uh, something like already established, like Documenta, it's something that we kind of like try to push further because if not now, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? You know? So maybe at, at that moment, uh, I'll give it to Reza or Andrea, maybe they want to have more say to it. Thank you. There, there is, is there some? Uh, there is one question uh, coming from the online. Um, a question, if I may, where does hapticality relate to abolition and exodus, if it does? Would it be more useful to collect a series of questions and perhaps you try to respond or? If, if they hear us. Uh, Fred, can you hear us? Yeah. I can, I okay. can. It's, it's funny, uh, I'm, I'm in this strange temporal position with regard to everybody. I imagine you guys from Ruin Group R2 where I'm looking at an image of myself on the screen who's about eight seconds behind where I am in my own mind. And um, I'm, I'm so stupefied by that, <laughs> you know, that, uh, that I don't know what to say or do. Um, it's, it's uh, we, we got to figure out some kind of way to make use of this 
of this temporal anomaly. Um, maybe we'll figure it out by, by the time we're done. So. And, and I also don't know if uh, I almost feel like maybe it would be better for me to type stuff into the chat and, and have somebody read it there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but, but, I, but I, anyway, I'm, I'm with you. I'm here with you, uh, and, except I'm not, you know? And yeah. I'm, I'm at the same time as you are, except I'm not. So, um, so we got to figure out how to work with that. And, and maybe it's, maybe what we're doing is sort of working through an allegory of the general's condition, you know, which is the non-locality that we have to try to practice of all of these uh, various social movements of, of abolition and exodus that we're, that we're trying to, uh, to, to, not so much to unify, but to, but to get some sense of their, of their, of their entanglement. Uh, maybe, you know, their non-monogamous, promiscuous entanglement. Yeah. Uh, hi, from Athens. Uh, this is Georgia. Hi, Fred. I'm so happy to see you. Um, I hope you received my book. Uh, I hope you have it in your desk. Um, Anyhow, I want to, and uh, Ruan Group, of course, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I want to connect both of the presentations uh, with um, one word that came to my mind when uh, Ruan Group was talking in regard to their form of uh, collectivizing or their collective. Uh, it was uh, instead of in, in to instituting uh, instead of institution, instituting is intuitive, like how, um, like intuition plays, um, uh, what kind of role intuition plays in regard to their practice of uh, collectivizing. And I think that word also connects as an anchor to um, the, the, the drive that brings to forth a move to become movement, uh, like an intuition, like a, kind of like a, we call it in Greek, like it comes from your stomach, you know? Um, so what is this intuition? Can you describe it? Can you tell us like it's, uh, it's a texture, it's a um, sense, it's smell, is there a sense uh, of it? And then um, connecting to that, it came to my mind the arrival instead of the exodus. Um, like personally, I had the pleasure to be uh, hosted in, in Jakarta in December of 2014 at Ruan Grupa's uh, commune. <laughs> studio, uh, you can call it anything you like. Um, and I, I, want to, I, want to, to, I want us all together to think also how you accepting, how you are, um, um, how you accept, how you, how you arrive. Do you arrive? Who, who is arriving? And then if you arrive somewhere, um, do you need to do an exodus from that that you arrive, and what that, how that happens? Okay, that's these were the two parts of my uh, questions, and it goes to anyone that wants to answer them. Thank you for the questions, uh, Georgia. So this is part of the elaboration. So par partly in our notions, or probably in my own opinions, this is could be like very 
very good to have all around uh, good friends there just to hang out and uh, having sort of conversations probably also uh, thinking toward about the things that we already presented but but yeah uh, like in like for example like even us here in in uh, in ruang rupas for example up until now and also to, uh, for the things that happen in our ecosystem so far uh, this if it's connect to the uh, let's say back again to the how it is very organic how it became us as a part of uh, working collectively actually back in our college here we we didn't even know what is collective actually what 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 is what is this connections to the to, to the reason on 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 working as a collective or what is collectivities for example this is part of our challenge back uh, during our college time because uh, because this is this like since the beginning when we start to receive uh, uh, the, the the way that how we educate within this uh, let's say uh, in my background of art institution for example it's not like really there's no such things as a, a, a collectivities or collectivism as a method. Oh no, no, I mean as a, as, a, as, a, as a method of as a strategies, for example. We don't have it in our mind. I mean, we don't have any examples. But through the notions in our uh, culture and how we be and and how we act, mostly uh, activate ourselves in the societies. The, the the mean of 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 working collective or being together in somehow it's really feasible throughout throughout every corner of the cities like like even in the streets it's mostly teach us to have the sense and also challenging the notions of being together and the notions on like really working together uh, finding not only for solutions, but finding how we like to integrate and also to like really cooking together because we are uh, mostly came from different uh, cultural uh, background and also we came from like a different uh, practices and then to be and to have this understanding or the notions to understand something with with our uh, rational uh, mind and probably in academic sense into in our into intellectualities uh, this is like a very uh, uh, difficult uh, for us to to put this as a formulations and becoming method to, uh, for like really learning so so that's why uh, most of our practices it is kind of like not react if, uh, reactivating the ones that we receive but we are uh, 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 be, being like active uh, for generating that probably our thought is could be conscious enough to deliver as a collective works or even collective living let's say and also how to to be sensible and 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 rational in the sense to to have this uh, force for us to like really do something together because that's why uh, we we never uh, we never thought that or 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 act uh, out of necessities. It, it should be come from our necessities. So this is this is like really important notions in in part our gesture. I mean, uh, we we don't need to uh, to to become. Uh, I mean. For us to think that uh, if we need to become sufficient, then it should be based in our necessities rather than uh, we collect lots of uh, different background and or different baggage or lots of baggage in our uh, career, and then suddenly you don't know how to do it, even though you have a surplus. So this is this is like, and then suddenly this is this is uh, evolve with the things or or the connection to the city like Jakarta which is for someone that not really connect to Jakarta is really difficult how to understand this and also like for someone who not quite acknowledge like what is 
for example, what is home, for example, for us to like really become something together, this is also quite uh, difficult because part of the reason why uh, even ruang, in Ruang Rupa we are very difficult on how we try to explain uh, how we could connect as a collective, how how it's becoming suddenly uh, 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 a taking part in, in, in this in this collectivities, for example. So probably this is my elaborations. I mean, I mean we could we could have like a long conversations after it. But thank you very much also to everybody. Yeah. Thank I guess one thing to actually kind of voice out because it's 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 in my head somehow that and talking about instituting we somehow have an order of things which says okay here are the talks and here is the order of discussion and uh, I also feel that the ending of Stefano's story it was also something that perhaps you know I felt personally needed some time <laughs> and I wasn't ready to even jump into a straight discussion or even jumping in to try to connect things and I don't know perhaps if something that is shared across the room and also will try to connect to different rooms and different time zones um, I think it's it's kind of hard to try to, f to find a way to actually and perhaps that's what Fred said perhaps it's something you know towards this kind of entangled <laughs> socialities or something to address but I I also kind of kind of feel here and now a little bit in this kind of awkward space where I, I you know, it's like it's hard to try to move for things forward towards one direction because that's how things meant to be. <laughs> and um, and um, also, it's also about, I guess, addressing these other spaces and other feelings that perhaps cannot really you know, take this root of things. So I just thought I had to voice it out and put it out there. <laughs> For the, in order to, to, to hear you, Maria, uh, I think Maria was first, but yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, all of the presenters. Uh, if you allow me, probably maybe a dual question in relation to the obvious that uh, uh, this is a talk about critical talk about hierarchy in the instituting and structural uh, structure of instituting and uh, the embracement of a rhizomatic environment and how can that be through the attempt of a Rwanda group uh, to embrace that in a social structure in a kind of struggling society in Europe in Jakarta in uh, the Americas in Asia all of the world that uh, at the moment we have all experienced that the hierarchy is basically making a suffocating communities and how can that be uh, the embracement of a rhizomatic uh, structure in, in art and in politics in relation to instituting uh, yes I would just it's just a kind of uh, input reflection or open question and anyone feel like responding now? Or? Yeah. I, could say, yeah. I could say thank you for your question. Um, s something brief to say about it is that um, just as just as you probably also um, just as you probably also see it, the hierarchies that we're experiencing are of course reactions to the ongoing social experiments um, of the transversal. Uh, so, um, part of what Fred and I are trying to talk about, for instance, when we were talking about the strike against MoMA, is that to organize against MoMA because of one of its latest crimes is to miss, first of all, that people have always been organized against MoMA, and, and that form of organization is staying the fuck away from it, right? They're already practicing transversal forms of aesthetic social life. What MoMA does is interrupt that. Um, so, so to strike MoMA, uh, ironically, can end up, you know, helping to to reform the police. Um, 
and, and police has maybe been a too simple way to think about uh, MoMA. So, so our efforts all, always are, um, first, how do we get out of the way of people who are already in rhizomatic formations long before the term came to be used? Um, and secondly, where and when will they let us join in these moments, in these um, forms of, of, of transversal social life, in these forms of, of the fugitive aesthetic? Um, and, and so that's where, that's where we start. Um, and of course, every time you start there, you know, the institution appears again. Um, hierarchy tries to reassert itself. Um, but, but we take inspiration from people who didn't and still don't uh, let that stop them. Can you put it, can you, Fred, can you just play that again? Because it was very quick for us. Let's see. He's in a different quantum zone. <laughs> it's all out of time. <laughs> Let's hope for resonance <laughs> here. <laughs> Everything's a bit out of time, <laughs> it feels. <laughs> oh, we cannot hear you, Fred. So no, what I... No. What I typed into the chat, it, it appeared for a minute and then it disappeared. Yeah. Um, I'll just read it. Okay. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, sort of an echo, I think, of what Stefano was saying, which is, you know, if, if all we do is respond to their outrages as if their outrages weren't a consumptive, reactive, desiring, disavowing response to the outrageous beauty of our practices of subsistence, then we can't move. So we have to remember move the group that Stefano was talking about in Philadelphia and not simply by way of the continuing brutalization of move in order to move. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, that's the, the distinction between, you know, movement uh, and move is, is I, I think, is, is an important distinction that we're trying to, to work through. Um, because so often what gets retrospectively uh, codified as a movement, um, even if the retrospection comes almost immediately, right? Um, as, as in such a way so that retrospection is actually overtaken by marketing, you know, or by a certain kind of institutionalization of the movement, right? Uh, or of moving, you know. But it's like like the 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 so often the the moment what we do becomes a movement is the moment that it stops, is the moment that it is still. Um, so like how do we keep moving, you know, against the grain of of you know, the formation or the claiming or the foundation of a movement, you know, um, and, and that seems, I think that seems to us to, to be parallel to this question of, you know, maybe something like how do we keep instituting, you know, uh, in, without ever having been stilled or, or congealed into, into an institution. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, and I think that this this comes back to to George's question, and um, and and I did get your book, and thank you for the book, George, and I apologize for not letting you know. Um, but the, you know, but the thing is, is that uh, yeah, there's this question of coming and going, um, this this question of which it, it seems to me that you know seems to us that both in both. That, that what we're talking about is the difference between an approach and a, and a, and a destination. Um, this, that maybe instituting and moving is, is, is this continual sort of practice of, of approach, um, which goes so much against the grain of, you know, of the sort of metaphysical foundations of the political economy that has been imposed upon us, which, 
which is all kind of predicated on on beginnings and ends, you know, rather than coming and going. This just brings in mind, Fred, one actually uh, a quote from another work of yours that I probably misquote, but it's it's not a matter of who is holding you down. And what matters is who is holding you up, and and I guess pointing towards that direction. It's it's also another way to to go about. But yeah, we can open to other questions. There was another question. You you will have to wait for the mic, otherwise. Uh, hello, I want to ask something. I'm not sure if I understood it well. That um, uh, you mentioned that knowledge is a good that is transformed to cash. So the more knowledge we accumulate, the more we are able to product and earn. So this perception about knowledge perhaps makes institution comes with institution and hierarchy hierarchy it, it it makes it seem so so to say natural so on top of the institution is the one who knows the most and turns the most and even lower a researcher a simple teacher and down those the students who are eager to earn and and learn so you think that this perception of education, of knowledge, as a good to be transformed to cash, brings institution hierarchy uh, automatically. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, it's a, it's a very well-formed question. I, all I can do is say yes. And, and I should add, really, that it's Derek Ford's work that I'm drawing on for that. And what he does, which um, which we think is nice, is he 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 shows the way uh, the problem is always posed as ignorance. And he reminded us of when we were trying to think about what policy was in our earlier work, and how policy is always about in the first instance pointing to someone else and saying what's wrong with that person, in order both to say there's something right with you and to intervene. Uh, in the way that you would like to intervene. And, and one diagnosis, of course, that you can make of people uh, is that they're ignorant. Um, and unfortunately, this is a diagnosis that can be made from the right or the left, um, from a position of being a professional or a position of being you know, an ordinary person on the street. Um, but in all those instances, uh, it's the beginning of imposition of, of, of hierarchy, of institution, on the person who gets the diagnosis. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to uh, pose a, a rather practical question to Ruan Grupa and Documenta. How um, is Ruru House and Kassel integrated in any decision-making? So how does this living room and kitchens have to um, yeah, basically um, ask people's opinions of what documenta should then consist in, and will it con consist in an exhibition? And will will other people have a say in what what this would entail, or how do you how do you work there? Lisa, you first. Uh, thank you for uh, very interesting questions because this is part of our question too in Roru House. So we are already elaborating uh, with these this notions and sense. But truly, uh, in the beginning, then we are trying to set up uh, what's called living room uh, uh, in, in Castle, let's say. Uh, but it but it came before towards of our uh, most of our practices and our process when we get invited or having residency somewhere else place as a collective as ruang rupas. I mean, so actually this 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 strategy actually is not new strategies and, and also uh, cannot 
always called as a strategies and also this is like a new practices among us even even among us here for sure to generating what is so-called living room and then how you initiate uh, this so-called living room as a part of uh, meeting uh, uh, knowing friends uh, hosting parties or having different or uh, broader conversations without acknowledging time wise or structures events or even uh, like like even we cannot say this is this is part on on, on how we would like to have this space is much more swarming in in, in the sense uh, we when we would like to acknowledge what what what, what is what is importance is to have this so called living room but uh, but in the sense on suddenly we could uh, as well quite lucky when uh, rural house is it, it, it's being announced in, it's being announced since the beginning as a part of the let's say new venues of uh, documentas so this is uh, for us this is very uh, it's, it should be like a good chance uh, for us to not on not not as part on how we would like to introduce our practices but also to um, to 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 put more into the the way that how we how we generate trust among castle ecosystem because for us it's really important when you would like to when 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 us would like to like open up every different uh, moment and situation to be shared the ones that we need to understand that there's there's always trust. There's always uh, like uh, connections within that you are trust to each other, and then you give a reason for them or for from from uh, uh, to also uh, uh, this uh, trusting capacities. It's always alive, and also in the sense that uh, to occupying the mistakes. This is this is like the things that we are learning uh, because we always would like to have space for us to do a mistake as well. And then since that, it's it's becoming much more productive. And then how it's connect to like the the, the institution itself, like Documenta on Fredisendung GmbH, for example, we are interdependent. And then we are we are, we have deep, we have deep, uh, we have uh, uh, independencies even to govern ourselves. Let's say to create a program, how to connect with the other uh, relations to the collective in castles, and also to acknowledge or extending and uh, even enhance something that already being done in castle and also learning about some things that being uh, done in the earlier uh, uh, edition of documenta for example but we back again to the like really very basic that what we would like to know is to become castle like to like really understand what this importance is to having rural house in castle just like when we had rural house back in arnhem for sons 2016 just like we had Ruru Gakko in IT Triennial, uh, 2000, I forgot, 2017 or 2015, for example. But this kind of practice, it's living in, in, in our way, how, how we would like to approach uh, 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 this specific uh, neighborhood, for example, but also how we would like to evaluate and to criticize ourselves by living in these daily connections. So this is also important that 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 it's only not about uh, practicing, but like living together. Like so, this is this is quite hard uh, uh, even up until now, especially in to regard the the, the light of the COVID-19, for example, to regard like how rural house is not quite accommodating very well for the public that could come uh, and then also we deal with the restrictions even though we we, we need to take taking care about the measurements of uh, of uh, uh, from the institution for example but the things that we did actually we don't want to change anything what we need is to accompany each other and fulfill the needs just like when we start to thinking about Let's let's cook something. Let's cook out of potato, for example. Each of every one of us here would like uh, could could have like a same uh, in, in, uh, uh, same thoughts about potatoes, but probably different recipes, different ingredients. So let's collect it. Let's collect it all, and then see what what comes up as a cuisine afterwards. So this is 
this is the way that how we are uh, connected so far and then and it's not an easy task it's not about the documenta itself but to become someone that relate to somebody else is always difficult but we love to facing this challenge every now and then so that's why i'm now i'm i'm passing the mic to andrea <laughs> thank you very much um uh, you were we were speaking about hierarchies and how to flatten hierarchies and Reza was mentioning trust and uh, I thought uh, I uh, add something uh, uh, let's say uh, practical to this when because it, it is part of the artistic practice of one group to invite and then um, give, to invite to Ruru House and to, to invite to uh, participate in this artistic, artistic practice and then also, you know, to build trust and give um, uh, important decisions uh, into other hands. And one example is the um, the corporate identity of Documenta 15 when Ruan Grupa was actually inviting students to work on it. Uh, a student collective from Jakarta and a student collective from Kassel. And um, 4002, the student collective from Jakarta then actually defined the very colorful uh, corporate identity for Documenta 15 while come and practice the uh, a young collective that has been um, that, that found each other or was initiated uh, during Documenta 14 actually and uh, they sustained and uh, finally were asked to do the corporate identity and work on the website of Ruru House. So this is like in my eyes this was totally this was what trust means to uh, give this in the hands of the students and to also show that um, uh, to show them that they own that they are already ready to do something like this they don't need uh, to kind of finalize exams they don't need to have like high uh, educational standards um, but they were able to do it while they were still and they still are students and uh, yeah, this is one thing. Another thing that I wanted to also add uh, in relation to Documenta as institutional organization, um, and that Ruan Grupa, like we said in our video uh, before, is not only or was not only inviting Documenta to become part of the ecosystem of Ruan Grupa, it is also important to show that the Ruru House of which we are speaking of is also somehow like an entity on its own. It's not a first venue of documenta uh, only. It's a place where the concept is going to grow, where and uh, Ruru House has an own address and an own web page. And uh, no, it's important that Ruru House uh, is can sustain also individually. Um, maybe you would like to say something to this uh, also, Riza, or maybe Farid. Farid, for you it's already so late. <laughs> I think it's 2, 2 a.m. at night, no? Almost, almost, almost. 2 a.m. So no, yeah, thank you very much, but I'll pass the mic first for now, uh, for other questions maybe even. Yeah. Yeah, there is one more question coming from the chat and uh, if there are other questions from, from here. It's a question uh, to uh, Fred and Stefano. Uh, could you say a bit more about the distinction between the anti-institution? Anti um, well, let's take, for example, the, the, the institution of the movement. Just, just to um, <clears throat> use one example of an institution. Um, 
Let's take, for instance, um, in the United States, the Civil Rights Movement, um, which is a movement of the United States, but as you know, um, there were civil rights movements all around the world in the, in the 1960s, Ireland, uh, South America, etc. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> on the one hand, the civil rights movement is understood as a kind of institution that develops for um, the gaining of full full rights, the integration uh, into institutions, the participation in politics, um, the, the, the end of fear from policing, etc., amongst African Americans, especially in the South. Well, of course, we already know from, if we study more closely, from any number of great scholars, Robin Kelly, for instance, notes how local these movements actually were and how the idea of a movement or an institution is sort of a, a creation um, of historians or of the media. But more than that, there's a, there's a, there's a story where J the great James Baldwin goes to, to, to interview a mother and her son. It's in, it's in, uh, it's in Nobody Knows My Name, a more uh, notes of a native son. And he goes to interview a mother and a son, and the son is going to uh, an all-white school. Um, he's, he's quote unquote, integrating it in the, in the language of the institution. Uh, and he goes to talk to the mother, and he goes to talk to the son. And of, of the 70 or so um, African-American uh, kids who might have gone to the school, he's the only one who actually goes. And so James Baldwin asks the mother, why did you decide to go through with this and, and to have your son go to this school? Because every day when the kid went, the principal would have to walk him in, abuse would be hurled at him. She says, well, it certainly wasn't so he could be around some white people. And as if that's not enough, she adds, can you imagine me having to hold on to, as a grandmother, a little white baby? I mean, is she part of the movement? Is she part of the institution or is she not? So I, don't, I think the question is not, not so easily answered, who's in or who's out. Um, what, I think instead what we actually have are a whole bunch of rhizomatic, transversal, fugitive uh, um, recreations of subsistence. You know, she, 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 she wanted her son to, to, to live, right? She goes on to explain there was nothing being taught in, in the local school um, because there's no, there was no funding for, for African-American schools. She, she wanted him to survive, and, and, and she developed a practice. Um, now, that practice then gets codified as if it's part of an institution or a movement, but it works against the movement and the practice just as much as it works in it. Um, and yet, you, you couldn't separate it from it. You couldn't say she could have sent that kid to the school anyway. Um, so when we're trying to th think through the anti-institutional and the anti-institutional, um, when we're trying to think to the relationship between movement and move, we're not trying to set up an opposition. We're, we're always interested in the cuts that people are already making, um, like this mother and her son. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Wait. Thank you. Uh, I would like to make a question which will put all these issues a little bit, a little bit more locally, as we are in Athens, and I will try to pick it up from some points where you've left it, which would be about this. And even sociality we're talking about in practices and my feel, and I can't claim sovereignty on that and generalize it, but my feel uh, as a Greek that n the recent years, this kind of, or decades, this kind of dispersed and destructive violence in life we're dealing with generally in the world, but let's place it a bit 
in uh, what I read in your recent article, uh, Refusing Completion, where a young scholar asks Fred, I think, that why can't my anger at what they've done to us be a legitimate intellectual position? Why must I filter my anger in order to be? And I would like to, to bring it more into this kind of, of, of structure of this feeling of, of uh, practices, anger, and a prompt maybe to, to, to form that kind of uh, new movement or to deal with this, this certain economy of anger into that and, and our mediation there, if, if you could, maybe all of you can, can contribute to that, but yeah. Um, well, I, that, that moment in which uh, that young, you know, scholar who has become a friend of mine said that was a was a kind of crucial moment, I guess, for 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 me and it became one for us both. Um, and it was partly because the the question turned out, I think, to be more difficult than than maybe e either she or I thought at the moment of her utterance of it. Um, because first of all, anger has always been a legitimate political position. Um, in fact, it, it, I, I actually think it, it could be argued that that anger is the default political position. Um, or maybe another way to put it would be the the default political disposition of the of the, of the settler. Um, he, he's always mad. Um, now, of course, when when my friend Arnell said, "Why can't my anger be a legitimate political position?" You know, that was the question that, on the one hand, answers itself because political positionality is a function of a kind of contest. And the, re the, the simple answer to the question is, do you have enough power to, to, to take on, to take up that political position? But then there's a, another deeper question that I think lies underneath it, or that maybe better, better way to put it is that it surrounds it, which is, um, you know, how do we refine our feeling? and our study so that the confluence of anger and political positionality doesn't have to be our default object of desire. I mean, and that's the, the question. And I think to me, that's a question about, well, that's, that's the best way I can put it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, it's, it's, uh, that's not an argument. That question isn't meant to preface an argument against anger. It's really meant to, to, to preface an argument against, it's really meant to preface an argument for the refinement of anger. And, and in a way, I guess, for the, for the radical depoliticization of anger. Okay. And um, I think there's a, <laughs> there's a phrase that we use in the, in that, piece that, that you um, mentioned, uh, the, the anger of a common love, which for us, you know, is a, is a practical matter. Thank you, Fred. And I think there is an alarm going on here uh, from another house or something. So apologies for that as we try to concentrate. Uh, I don't know if there are any other kind of urgent uh, questions or responses or whether we kind of live with this common run and the cuts that people can make and the move and the movements and the ecosystems and things to explore in the next sessions and days. And uh, just I'd like to thank you all very much for being here with us and all of you being here in this kind of, ah, now it stopped.
<laughs> in this kind of very hot summer night in Athens. Thank you all. Thank you.